doesn't still here we go. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, this word means sin. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. So they brought him to the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Uh-oh. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man, that is Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled the insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to, to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt 
remains. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you moved John to record this amazing story. Thank you for what it teaches about your son, Jesus Christ, and what it teaches us about various responses to Jesus. We ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us in a way that only he can, and that you would individually apply this message to each heart that is here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Marina and I have a special friend in Wausau. His name is Roy Luber. Uh, we are friends with him because we have a lot of things in common. Uh, he loves to talk about theology. I've had many uh, deep, interesting conversations with him about scripture and incidents and people in the Bible. Sometimes he'll call me out of the blue and say, hey Kurt, I've been reading in Zephaniah. I said, oh no, what <laughs> obscure passage has he read now that I, I don't know how to answer him. But anyway, I love how he loves the Lord. He also has a delightful sense of humor. It, he doesn't just laugh, he, he roars with laughter. His whole body is involved in his laughter. Another reason uh, we like him is he loves to eat. <laughs> we go out once in a while and we kind of sit there just watching Roy eat, watching him devour his uh, burger and slurp his drink and savor his salad. He also loves animals. Uh, when we haven't seen him for a while, he won't ask, uh, hey, Kurt Breed, how are you? No, he'll ask how our dogs are. <laughs> how are Mindy and Rudy doing? So uh, we have so much in common. But there's one area where we have absolutely nothing in common. There's one way in which we are totally different. One reality that separates us completely. Because Roy Luber is blind. He has never seen. He, like this man in John 9, has been blind since birth. He has no concept of color. He can't even distinguish light from darkness. Uh, when I walk into his apartment, it's dark. I said, Roy, why don't you have the lights on? <laughs> then I say, oh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to you, does it? Does it, Roy? Uh, you know, he, he doesn't know what is beautiful and what is ugly. He doesn't know light from darkness. I, I can't imagine what it's like to be blind, to never have seen the people that I love, to never have seen a sunset or a bird in flight or the beauty of the snow or to watch a, a football game or see a flower or the clouds in the sky. I, I can't imagine what it would be like. Well, today we walk with Jesus and his disciples and we encounter just such a man. A poor, blind, beggar named, uh, let's see, anybody help me out, what, what was his name? No name, he's a member of the No Name Hall of Fame. I don't know why uh, John didn't record his name, maybe he didn't, maybe he never learned his name, but I'm going to give him a name, I'm going to call him a poor, blind, beggar named Jonad. I just picked that name out of the sky. As far as I know, there's no one else in the Bible by that name. But we're going to call him Jonad. <coughs> He's part of an intriguing counter that provides significant insight into human nature, tendencies toward good and evil, and how we respond to the person of Jesus Christ. So first in this passage, we see the reality of human suffering. In the first 
two verses, the disciples look at this blind man and they say, who sinned? What caused this man to be born blind? Obviously somebody must have done something wrong. Somebody sinned in a very bad way. You know, they didn't ask, did someone sin? They said, who sinned? Obviously someone sinned. That was kind of the, uh, the thought back in those days, that tragedy and illness and deformity was the result of a sin. Jesus doesn't so much deal with the question of who, but he answers the question why. Neither his parents sinned. That wasn't the problem. But this man was born blind so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And I can imagine the disciples are like, sure, the, the work of God is going to be displayed in this sorry specimen of a human being? You've got to be kidding. God does not lead us into deep water to drown us, but rather to cleanse us. Uh, following the service, uh, John is going to hand out to you a piece of paper that has 36 ways God uses human suffering. Okay? So don't forget to, to grab that and you can study uh, those 36 reasons for about the next eight weeks. So God uses <coughs> suffering. There are none so blind as those who will not see. So that's the reality of human suffering. Secondly, here we see the reality of spiritual blindness. And that is seen in the reaction of the Pharisees and the parents. First, the Pharisees, they uh, exhibit the blindness of tradition. You remember the Pharisees were the most religious, righteous, rigid people of the first century. They had a passion for getting everything right. Uh, the I's were dotted, the T's were crossed, they were ecclesiastical watchdogs. They weren't only concerned about their own righteousness, they, they tried to make sure that everyone else was righteous and followed the law as well. And uh, you note that the problem was they weren't so much concerned. Here was a man who had been blind all his life and now he saw and their only concern was he did it on the Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath laws. They forgot uh, that Man is not made for the Sabbath, but uh, the Sabbath is made for man. And so the blessing of the Sabbath had become a burden to them. They were more concerned about the precept than the person. And they missed this miracle. They missed the joy because of their pride and their uh, unteachableness. They were blind despite the overwhelming evidence that truly Jesus was who he said he was. So their tradition was more important than a life redeemed and a body cured. Now the parents of Jonah show us the blindness of fear. You remember they were afraid to say what really had happened for fear that they would be thrown out of the synagogue. Now before we jump all over them, and say what terrible people they are, uh, we need to be reminded of what it meant to be thrown out of a synagogue. You lost all your religious and social status. You became like a nobody if you got thrown out of the synagogue. And so this was no little deal, and we can kind of understand uh, why they were so afraid. So spiritual blindness, you know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel 
and the glory of Christ. So spiritual blindness is so much worse than physical blindness because unless we open our spiritual eyes and let the glorious light of the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ in to heal us, we will be eternally blind, groping in the dark, searching for that purpose and wholeness and peace that will never come apart from Jesus Christ. So the reality of human suffering, the reality of spiritual blindness, and now some good news, the reality of faith. And this is exhibited by this poor blind beggar named Jonah. And he, he shows the reality of faith in four ways. First of all, submission. He submits to Jesus' hand. He submits to the mud that is placed on his eyes. The muddy salve that is placed on his eyes. You know, uh, if you had been a blind, blind man in that day and age, you would know about spit. Because there was a game that people played on blind people. They would come up to them and spit in their face and then ask them, tell us, who was it that spit in your face? So Jonah undoubtedly knew about people spitting, but this time this person doesn't spit on his face. Instead, he spits in the dust and makes mud and places it on his eyes. And somehow Jonah submits to that. Secondly, he shows the reality of faith in obedience. Because Jesus tells him to do a very strange thing. After he places the mud on his eyes, he says, Now I want you to go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Now why was that a strange request? It was a strange request because the healing pool was not Siloam. It was the pool of Bethesda. Why did Jesus not tell him to go to the healing pool, Bethesda, rather than the pool of Siloam, which not only was not the healing pool, but it was on the far side of town. It was on the far corner of Jerusalem. And so Jesus asked him to do a strange and almost impossible thing for a blind man to somehow find his way all, all the way across the city and do what Jesus asked. You know, this tells me something significant about God's call. If it seems unreasonable, unnerving, and uncomfortable, you probably can know that God has something to do with it. <laughs> it's strange about God's will. It's not always the easy choice or the comfortable choice. Sometimes it's the most difficult choice. Um, our pastor Kim Swenson uh, of Bethany Church there in Wausau is retiring, but he wants to keep busy in some kind of ministry. So he's been praying for months, and especially this last week, about God, what is your will after I retire from Bethany Church? Well, he and his wife took a week apart and they prayed and they, they fasted and they sought the will of God. And he says, for some reason, I had like four or five choices. <laughs> Three or four of them were real comfortable. I could slide into that ministry without any trouble. It would be real comfortable and real easy for me. But the strange thing is, God is calling me to lack the flambeau. Of all places, why would God call me to Lake the Flambeau? But he says, I can't get away from this call. He says, I know it's going to be difficult. I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be discouraging in many ways and many times. But I can't resist the call of God. And I thought, uh, that is the way it is so often with the call of God on our lives. We're not involved in a Sunday school picnic. 
we're involved in a, in a battle, and sometimes God asks us to face difficult things. Well, thirdly, Jonah exhibits the reality of faith by his witness. You know, they ask him, you know, who, who did this? And, you know, how, how did he do it? And uh, basically he says, I don't know. I only know one thing. Once I was blind, and now I can see. That's what I know. That was his witness. That was his huge testimony. That was his debate. You know, said one thing I know. I think there's a lesson for us there in our our witnessing. You know, sometimes we think we have to have all the answers. Sometimes we think we need to be great debaters like Robbie Zacharias or, uh, you know, some great theologian. No. All we need to do is tell what we have seen and heard and experienced. That's how simple Christian witness ought to be. Lastly, Jonah exhibits faith by worship. He finally comes to the conclusion that this man is no ordinary man, but he is the Lord himself. And he says, I believe. Maybe he didn't understand, maybe he wouldn't have been able to explain, but he says, I believe. And that's exactly what God asks us to do. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to be able to understand all the fine points of, of theology. All you need to do is believe. All you need to do is have faith. So let's look at, at Jonab's journey of faith. He goes through four stages. In verse 11, he says, the man they call Jesus. So first, you know, as far as Jonab was concerned, this man was just a man. When we go down to verse 17, they're again questioning him about this man, and he says, he is not just a man, he's a prophet. He's someone who speaks for God. There's a great pro progression there. In verse 33, he says that this man were not from God, he couldn't do these things, so he's come to the conclusion that this man indeed has come from God. He not only speaks for God, but he's come from God. He has a special connection with God. <coughs> and finally, in verse 38, he calls him not just a man, not just a prophet, not just someone who comes from God, but he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Now everyone here in this sanctuary is in one of those four categories. You may be here and you believe that Jesus was a man. Yes, he walked the earth. He he was an important historical figure, like Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, or Marco Polo. You may believe that Jesus truly is a prophet, that he spoke the truth and let the pieces fall where they may. He was a prophet. You may even agree that Jesus came from God, that he had some special connection with God. And there was a certain amount of uh, inspiration and mystery associated with him. And then there are some of you here today who know Jesus as Lord, as the very Son of God, as the one and only God who came in the flesh, full of grace and truth. And if Jesus is who he claimed to be the Son of God, God in the flesh, then the only reasonable response is to fall down before Him and worship Him and surrender your life, body, soul, heart, and mind. And to say in effect, 
God, I can't live the Christian life myself. I ask you to come in to my life and live it for me. That's what Paul had in mind in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus had many interesting conversations with his disciples. One of the most interesting is when he met with his disciple and he asked him a question. He said, guys, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, this is very interesting. This is cool. We can have all kinds of debates about what people think about you, Jesus. Some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're the prophet Elijah. Some think you're Jeremiah. And that was a cool conversation until Jesus looks at his disciple and said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? That was the important question. That's the crux of the matter. Not what other people say about Jesus. But rather, who do you say that I am? Who do you think Jesus is? Do you agree that he is not just a man, not just a prophet, hasn't just come from God, but that he is the very one who demands to be the Lord, the master, and the ruler of your life, the son of the living God? Some cannot see. Some will not see, some fear to see, but some see the light comes on and the light comes in and they see Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, and they say, Lord, I believe, and they fall down and worship Him. You know, Jonah uh, probably woke up that morning it was like any other morning, I'm going to go sit on a corner and, and beg, like I've done every day of my life. He never imagined what was about to happen. He experienced healing, physical healing. That would have been enough probably for him. But he wasn't only healed once, he was healed twice. He not only was able to see with his physical eyes, he was able to see with his spiritual eyes and he saw Jesus as he truly was. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he fell down <coughs> and worshiped. That's what happened to him. He wasn't expecting it. He wasn't in plan, but it happened to him. And it can happen to each of us. And I trust that each of us has gone to the fourth step where we know Jesus is the Lord and He is the one that asks to control and to live our life for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Again, we thank you for these words. Thank you that uh, you led John to write down so many details that speak to us about who Jesus is and how we respond to him. I ask that you would take away our spiritual blindness and if there is any barrier between you and us, I ask that by the power of your Spirit you would remove that, that we may see you clearly, and that we may not only proclaim with our lips, but live it out in our life that truly you are the Lord. And everything we do is an act of worship. For you love us far beyond we can ever love ourselves, or any one can love us. Thank you for your love that is 
eternal and unconditional and will never pass away. We praise you, Lord, today for, for your word. And now, may the love of Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget to uh, grab these 36.